I have to read my own slides. So these were the learning objectives right here, how with proper job planning, a robust scheduling process, the technicians will be able to perform the activity to a high level of uh, quality assurance, quality control. Anybody want to take a guess? What is the average utilization of a technician? Anybody know? Anybody want to take a guess? Yeah. 80%, 50%. So here, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 30, 30, 35, 35, anything? Anybody? Around the world, the average utilization of a maintenance technician is between 17 and 25%. All right, it's not to say that they're bad technicians, right? It's not to say that they're not good employees. It's the system that we put them in that allows that to happen. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit. Um, and that's that spreadsheet that I'm gonna share if you'd like. Uh, identify the importance of training and preparing individuals to execute your maintenance activities to be both efficient and effective. If anybody does uh, look at this month's uh, edition of uh, facility maintenance decisions, I wrote an article this month. It's in the magazine this month, okay? And it is talking specifically about that. All right, the skill set and the skill shortage that everybody's going through right now. It's universal, it's all around the world. We have to have a robust uh, training program in place, okay? Here's an interesting thing. Let me draw, let me, let me draw every maintenance department in the world. Okay. Now you can debate with me some of my numbers, but I bet I'm pretty close. 20, 40, 30, and 10. Okay. So let's, let's keep the math simple because it is in the afternoon. I hate doing math in the afternoon. All right. So we have 10 people that work in your maintenance department. I'm willing to bet that two of them are absolute superstars. All right. They can fix anything. Give them a potato, a rubber band, a paper clip, and by gosh, they can make a 12 gauge shotgun out of the thing. I mean, they're that good, right? Then I have the next four individuals, the next 40%, very, very good at what they do. They come into work every day, they're reliable, they do a good job, they're efficient, they're effective. At the end of the day, they, go, they can go home, they go home. Okay? Then I have the next three, or the next 30%. Now, they may not have the skill set yet. They may be brand new to maintenance, okay, but they got potential. And then every organization in the world has a 10 percenter. Anybody want to volunteer what you think I mean by a 10 percenter? 90% of your problems. Oof. Yeah, you're right. I call them the bottom feeders, right? They're in their own mind, they're the only ones that do any work right? None of you do work. My boss is a jerk, all right? I don't even know why I work for this facility, right? Every fiber in their body is negative. And you're right, as managers and supervisors, we spend about 80 or 90% of our time with those individuals, when we really should be spending time with the 30 percenters, okay? So we have that, and then right here, give a little TLC to the maintenance group, all right? Now I threw that up there right there because I, when I was searching around for a graphic for TLC, this one came up. I don't know about you, but I've never been to a dentist where they've shown me TLC. I just thought that was kind of amusing that they call their company TLC Dentistry. Anyways, okay. This is a very interesting slide right here. I want you to look at this slide and think money. Now, again, I've been doing this, this type of work now for over 21 years now, and I do travel around the world. So these are universal numbers that I see. Average maintenance budget, we waste about 30 to 33%. It's called rework, or we have time to do it over again, but we don't have time to do it right the first time. All right, 64% of, 63, I'm sorry, 63% of maintenance activities are self-induced. Maintenance induced maintenance. All right, so that contributes to that. 18% of a typical technician's day is looking for materials or uh, parts. Another 24 to 26% of their day is walking to and from the job site. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. 58% um, of a typical storeroom 
we have filled with materials that we have not touched in over three years. I am not saying it's obsolete materials. I'm simply saying that over half of our inventory we have not used. Now, there's a number of reasons why that's the case, okay, but um, the case still remains that we still have a warehouse full of materials that we don't really use. Of the remaining 42% of what we refer to as active inventory, 60% of that is overstocked. I have never been hired by a client to ever come in and say, yeah, can you recommend how much space we can reduce the warehouse by? It's 100% the other way. They ask me in my recommendation, how much more space? Now here's the issue. If I recommend more space, what are you gonna do with it? it you're gonna fill it up. And then five years from now, you're gonna call me back. You're gonna say how much more space we need. So there is a right number out there, okay? Of what we need to have in our storeroom. Uh, active re uh, maintenance is three to four times more expensive than planned. All right, so again, some numbers that I've collected over the years. Yes. Sixty-three percent of maintenance activities are self-induced. Does that mean that that we go out to maintain something and then we actually break it while we're maintaining it? Uh, that's where the time comes in and the skill set, right? Uh, because in our most critical pieces of equipment, or well, every case in facilities is an emergency, right? So we run out there. Here's the best way I can explain that. I worked with a gentleman in Texas a number of years ago, the maintenance manager. He was handing out the job assignments to his crew. He handed a work order to one of his technicians. The technician raised his hand and he said, his name was Bill. He said, Bill, he said, um, I, was, I, rep I repaired that pump yesterday. And Bill, without missing a beat, turned around. And he said, no, yesterday you worked on it. Today, I want you to fix it. So that's a prime example right there, okay? So a lot of duct tape and a lot of bailing wire to get things put back together again. Um, current state, again, these are some things that I've witnessed over there, organizations. These are some of their pain points that we see today. Um, main pain points are unplanned downtime or emergency maintenance, which accounted for 90%. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all these. Um, monitoring aging assets. Obtaining asset data was a big one. And then there's maintenance skills, 25% or almost 25% was finding the right skill set. Facility maintenance professionals trying to rebrand itself rather than, um, I, I, I worked with a plant manager one time and I asked about his, his they, their official job title were maintenance engineers. That was their official job title. And I was asking about the skill set of his maintenance engineers. And he corrected me and said, I don't call them maintenance engineers. I call them change engineers. Because that's all they did. As they went out, whatever was broken, they just changed it out. So it's a little bit about what that's talking about right there when we talk about simply replacing those parts. Um, Today's technology is, is, is moving at incredible pace, an incredible pace. I mean, even 10 years ago, when we're talking about some of today's technology, that would have been way out there. But that's the reality that all of us are wearing today. Technology is just moving along at warp speed. Um, right here, unfortunately, studies show that most investment in new building equipment and technology fall way short of what their desired uh, results are going to be, right? And again, there's a number of reasons why that occurs. Managers looking to invest in new facility uh, technology and equipment must balance, this is a big one, must balance um, the cost um, versus the performance that we expect. And then by doing so, by doing so or not doing so, what are the risks? So that's a challenge right there. Maximize these investments and in innovation. Essentially, the manager must be have a robust training program, capture equipment history, diagnose root cause, all right, technicians, and then strong, strong work management processes. When I talk about work management process, I'm talking about how do we identify work, how do we prioritize that work, how do we plan it, how do we schedule it, and how do we execute it safely. 
And then when we close that work order out, what kind of analysis are we doing, right? Root cause, continuous improvement, all those types of things. All right, so this is what I suggest we do. We showed the maintenance group, the facilities group, a little bit of TLC. Uh, time, the labor and control. Um, time, I'll reference two points right here. The first and the most uh, important uh, new employee, the most important time of a new employee is the first 48 uh, hours of their employment. So let me tell you a little bit of a story on that and see if it resonates with some of you. Because this is a personal experience. You join a new organization, you show up on the first day, you go into the reception area, you sit there and you wait for somebody to come and get you. Your boss comes and meets you. They walk you around the facility, introducing you to a hundred people and you'll never remember their names. They show you where your workstation is gonna be, your office or wherever your workstation is gonna be. Here's your new laptop. Here's all those things. You don't have a username. You don't have a password yet. And they say to you, look, I have an open door policy. If you have any issues, I'm right down the hall. Come on down and see me. And then they leave you there. And then that's when you start thinking like, what did I just do, right? The first 48 hours of employment is the most critical because that will set up their success for the rest of their employment. So that's one. So that's one of the times right there. The second example right here, the time uh, is crucial issue to, for technicians when it comes to maintaining equipment, maintenance technicians begin or to have adequate time to do the job right the first time. Again, 63% of maintenance activity is self-induced because we are in such a hurry, right? To get that, up, whatever that is back up and running. Labor uh, before the pandemic, which is sometimes hard to even remember, um, just retaining technicians was a tough task. Now the challenge really is, is even, even finding it. Um, uh, I was just talking to my son-in-law who owns a business a couple of days ago. He has never seen ever the amount of effort that they are um, um, applying to find qualified candidates. And they find the qualified candidates, they train them, and then they quit. He said his, his turnover is unbelievable. He's never seen this ever, how much turnover that he's getting, okay? So even that's a challenge for us now, right? I mean, do we, I mean, think about that. Do we really wanna spend the time to actually train this individual where we got a 50-50 shot if they're gonna stick around long enough or not? I mean, that's a challenge for all of us. Um, control right here. Control can be, uh, mean several things, but in the context of what we're talking about today, um, I wanna refer to labor and cost control condition by monitoring um, their activities, implementing uh, some condition-based monitoring uh, or moving more towards condition-based monitoring, and then also have a pretty good uh, PM preventive maintenance plan in place. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about each one of those. I'm gonna walk over on this one because I'm, I'm, I'm not spending enough time over here. So I'm gonna walk over here. Um, time, baseline performance. All right, so managers to ensure time, baseline performance requires monitoring and performance and reacting correctly to any deviation. I do facilitate and teach a leadership and supervision course. And with every course, I ask the attendees, what percentage of your day are you actively supervising your staff? Anybody wanna guess what's the number one answer? Far and away, we were playing Family Feud. Bing, the number one answer. 20%. 5%. That's it, 5%. That's terrible. I mean, all you have to do is look up Webster's Dictionary and look at the definition of supervise, okay? And, and again, there's a number of reasons why that occurs, right? Meetings and all these other things that get wrapped up, but essentially that 5% is the morning meetings or the shift handover or when they hand out the job assignment. We have to be able to manage people. We have to understand what they're doing. First of all, first and foremost, by the way, is are they working safely? That's number one, right? They have to conduct. I don't care what the situation is because I've gone into some organizations where if it's an absolute emergency, 
where does safety fall in their pecking of the priority list? Sometimes that priority of safety tends to fall down that, that ladder. Safety is always number one. One of the responsibilities for supervisors and managers. Managers need to develop policies and procedures uh, that the tech, uh, technicians need to adhere to, um, execute maintenance strategies and all the things that, again, we're gonna talk about in just a, a minute or two. And then managers need to use the data to identify where the labor hours and dollars are being spent. Again, I'm gonna share with you a spreadsheet that I developed years ago, and I'll tell you the story behind that. Garbage in, garbage out, right? Um, we cannot make good business decisions using poor data. Just can't happen. So there has to be a high level of uh, data integrity being inputted into your CMMS. Have to, okay? Here's the spreadsheet that I'm talking about, and I'll actually show it to you right here. This, this is number one, by far the most requested document that I've ever created in my life. And that's why I'm more than willing to share it with anybody that would like to use it. I was a plant manager a number of years ago. My maintenance manager came in to me and they said, Andy, we need to hire two 10 more technicians. That's what he said. He came in and said, I, need, I can't keep up with the work. I need to hire two more technicians. And what did I say? No. I said, no. The reason I said no was because he came to me with an emotional request. All right. I cannot make a business decision based on emotion. I need data. I need this thing called return on investment. Because at the end of the day, as a plant manager, I was responsible for take everything off the table, but I was responsible for one financial statement, p &L. And if I'm adding headcount, that's dipping into my bucket, right? So I need to prove the business case of why I needed to add headcount. That's when I developed this spreadsheet. Now, let me play around with something. I got to get out of here because apparently the link isn't working. Let me show you the power of what I'm talking about as far as managing time, all right? And the power, by the way, of maintenance planners and supervision. The top section here, can everybody see that? Or let me blow it up a little bit more. There we go. Anybody see that? Can you do me a favor? Can you cover your left eye and read the third line down for me? No, that's not going to work. All right. Can, I, can you guys see it? I'll just, I'll do it one more. All right. Okay. We'll start there. This is the, I always used to say this is a live version. This, this is the actual version of one of the clients that I worked with. They had 42 maintenance technicians. We cannot do anything. Well, we can, but the top section of this spreadsheet is the finance. These are my labor rates. There's 42 maintenance technicians uh, at this facility. Their average hourly rate, if I remember, was $39, right? $39.32, which was fully burdened. Do I need to blow this up even more? You sure? Well, come on up here. There's a plenty of seats. Look, I'll do it even more. Because this is worth it. Oops, wrong line. Because this is worth the price of admission right here. All right. I got you up to 110 font. Is that okay now? All right. We have 42 maintenance technicians. Average hourly rate fully burdened was $39. Um, they did uh, overtime right here. I think their overtime, if I remember, was 18%. Uh, so we need to add that into my labor. Uh, we had supervisor managers and storeroom uh, per salaries in there. So that added to my maintenance uh, um, expense. Okay, so in this example, um, the maintenance was $3.4 million. Uh, total pay, I'm sorry, total payroll was $4.7. Now, if I divide that by 42 technicians, my hourly rate is no longer $39. Okay, Does everybody, is everybody with me so far? So now our hourly rate is up to uh, uh, $54. That money comes out of you know, our budgets or in some organizations that money comes out of our profit. 
okay? And a lot of the companies I work with, we're in the business to make money. All right, the next section right here is our um, controlled, or I'm sorry, our uncontrolled losses. On average, uh, personal time off, they average three weeks, so 15 days. So I need to take 15 days times 42 individuals, and I need to remove those bucket of hours out of my capacity. I'm sorry, I skipped over that. If you take um, 42 people times 2080, right? That's a full, 2080 is a full year. That's my 100% capacity, right? That's my 100% capacity. Now I need to start chipping away at that number, all right? So if I take personal time off, I need to take those hours off. They did not have um, sick leave, um, but they did have a 4% absenteeism rate. So I need to take those hours out of my bucket. So now if I take those hours out of the bucket, all right, those 8,000 hours, I need to take that down. Now, what does that do to my hourly rate now based on 42 individuals? That hourly rate now is closer to $60 an hour. I can tell you right now that most organizations that I've ever dealt with do not look at maintenance this way. All they see is the $39 an hour, but it, it gets a lot worse. It gets a lot worse. This is the bottom section I want you to look at. Now, I want you to keep one thing in mind. These are not my numbers. These are actually the, the, this client's numbers based on some time studies and based on some analysis and everything else. I'm gonna start taking and chipping away some hours. Personal time, that was like their lunch. Everybody got 30 minutes but I got to take that out of my bucket, right? So 30 minutes came out from everybody. Non-authorized breaks, hour and a half a day. By, by the way, this is an eight hour shift. So the 30 minutes out of the like eight, like Oh no, it gets better than that. <laughs> it gets better than that, but yes. All right. Um, what's non-authorized breaks? Yes. Uh, that would be authorized or at least allowed. Lunch is at noon. Do we? Oh, yeah, sometimes, particularly if you have Mexican the night before. Um, lunch is at noon. Do we break off at noon for lunch? 11 30, yeah, right? Look, the worst thing you can possibly do, right, is going to lunch and pull a hammy. Right? So there's got to be a cool down period. You got to ease into lunch. Right? So yeah, 11.35 is probably a good time. Right? At 12.30, are you right back on the job again? Warm up. Yeah, exactly. There's got to be a warm up period. The worst thing that can happen is you jump right back on that equipment and then all of a sudden you get carpal tunnel or something. Right? So, there's that, so that's a bathroom break, smoke breaks, cell phone time, Google time. Those are all non-authorized. Now these guys average about an hour and a half a day. The next one right here, they did not have any maintenance planners. So all 42 maintenance technicians plan their own jobs for the day. That's another hour and a half out of their day. Um, average technician spent uh, 24 to 26% of their day walking to and from the job site. So that's travel. Another 18% of an average day is looking for parts and materials. All these hours need to be taken into consideration and reduced or deducted from our capacity, our labor capacity. Now, what in- Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. <laughs> Observations, there's a thing called, if anybody's ever heard of a dilo, it's a day in the life of, um, it's also called time studies. I do not want anybody in this room to hire me to do dialogues because <laughs> I hate them. You hate them. I hate them. Essentially, let me just sum it up. I'm attached to your hip all day long and I document every single thing you do. It's called the Hawthorne effect, by the way. If I'm watching you all day long, what do you think your utilization is? And I'm documenting it, by the way. Oh, like 110%. I don't have time for a bathroom. I don't have time for lunch. 
I don't have time for anything. I, I'm really busy. But as soon as I go away, you go right back to that 17 to 24%. It's called the Hawthorne effect. If I'm watching you, you're going to be a superstar. You might be a 10 percenter, but when I'm watching you, you're absolutely a 20 percenter. Okay, but this is over 20 years of doing things like that. Personally, I do job sampling. So it, you like it much better because I'm not with you all day long. I like it because I'm not breathing down your neck. So these are job sampling examples. Okay, let's go back to this. By us operating at 25% utilization, uh, direct time on tools, right? Time on tools, direct labor. In this example, we're down to 18%. What does that mean? That means that is no longer $39 an hour. It is now costing the organization $239 an hour. That's huge. That's huge. Again, organizations do not look at expenses like this. They just see the $39 an hour. All right. Now, by us operating with 42 individuals at 25%, what does that equate to to full time employees? 28 people. 28 people that we have on our payroll by operating at 25%. That means essentially, I want 28 of you to sit in the break room all day long. Do whatever you want. You can Google search all day long, read the newspaper, sit on your phone all day. Okay, you can watch Squid Games, which is a really dumb show, by the way, if anybody's ever watched it. Um, I've watched two episodes, that's it, I'm done. I'm not gonna watch anymore. All right, this is what I want you to pay attention to. All right, maintenance planners. I'm going to take a couple of those 28 individuals in my break room and I'm going to turn them into maintenance planners. Okay, so the planning no longer relies with the um, technicians. Maintenance planners are going to do that. So I'm going to zero that out. When I schedule 42 individuals, I'm going to make sure that I'm going to schedule them for a utilization of at least 85% of their day. I'm gonna keep them busy. Now, those estimated hours comes off of my planners with their estimated hours. That's how I build up my schedules with estimated hours. So I'm gonna take, I'll tell you what, I'm still gonna give you 30 minutes, all right? I'm still gonna give you a cool down and a warm up period. So let's go with 30 minutes, all right? Uh, let's go with 30 minutes right here. Look at the numbers. Look at the utilization. Look at the direct labor. We went from, what was it, $239 an hour? Was it $239 an hour? We are down to 106 now. And that is the equivalent of how many FTEs? 17. Did I hire anybody? Say that again. Say it louder. That's exactly right. All I simply did was just move the players. This is what your this is what your the leadership in your organization want to hear. <laughs> That's what they want to hear. I didn't hire anybody. I just moved some of the pieces around and look what happened to my utilization by doing that. Now, let's go back to my supervisors, right? I'm going to put some of the uh, responsibility on my supervisors that allowed some of that unplanned time so as a manager or leader, what I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out what my supervisors and managers are doing so I can relieve some of those roadblocks to get them out to what they're supposed to be doing. Everybody with me so far? This is the reason why this is the number one requested document that I share with my clients. Okay, because this is return on your investment. This is the business case for you right here, because at the end of the day, it does come down to money. Okay, any questions on that? Oh, sorry, I can make another adjustment here. Looking for parts and tools. There's a process that we can put in our storeroom called kitting and staging of materials. So I no longer want my high price maintenance technicians going to get their own parts and tools. I want a lower price storeroom clerk to do that for them and put all those materials together. So if they no longer had to do that, that can go to zero. Now you're over, you're at world-class numbers now. 
World-class utilization is 65%, okay? Okay. Let's go back to PowerPoint. Okay. Okay, now what we talk about here is the daily work assignments right here. So again, I'm talking about control and time, time really. Supervisors directly responsible for assigning the work to the crews because essentially they know who, they know who the 20, 40, 30, and 10 percenters are. By the way, are my 10 percenters more comfortable working in a control, I'm sorry, are my 20 percenters more comfortable working in a controlled environment or a chaotic environment? What do you think? You, get, you got a 50-50 shot here. Chaotic. I mean, think about it. We as managers, because I was guilty of this, by the way. All right, if I got two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, you're not supervisors. Go back there, all right? I got 12 supervisors in this room. 13, I'm sorry, I'm one of them. Whose equipment is the most critical? Who's, whose equipment, right? We're all department supervisors here. Who's, whose equipment is most critical? Mine. Wrong, mine. <laughs> Your boss. Well, yeah, he's on vacation or she's on vacation. <clears throat> exactly. So when, when you have an emergency in your department, who are you going to call? 20, 20, 40, 30, or 10? You're going to call the 20. You're going to call the best that you got because it's my equipment, which is the most critical. My department, I'm responsible for it. Those individuals tend to like the chaotic environment because they get to swoop in, they get whatever needs to be repaired, they repair the job, and we as managers then do what? What do we do? When they come in and they get our equipment back up and running, what do we do? We pat them on the back and say, good job. That's a learned behavior, by the way, all right? Their comfort level is to be rewarded to be that fireman, that fire person to come in and put the fires out. Anybody here got a dog? Huh, anybody got a dog? I got a dog, Leo. I mean, now his name is Leo. Now I live on the road. And when I drive home and I'm on the road for two weeks, three weeks or whenever I'm gone, all right? Two things happen. Either my wife is really depressed and the other thing is when I walk in through the front door, there's Leo at the front door waiting for me. And what do I do? I drop my backpack, I drop my luggage, I scratch his little ears and be, oh, you're such a good little boy. And I go into the kitchen and I get him a milk bone. That dog didn't do jack. All that dog did was meet me at the front door and I rewarded him for that, right? Now I got a big old pair of steel toe boots. Now, if I came home and Leo stand at the door and I open up that door and I kick him inside the head, it's not going to take very long for him to learn. Oh, crap, he's home. I'm out of here. Right. So understand that I, that's a little off the subject right here, but understand that, that there's some people that are very comfortable being firefighters. We have to understand that because the whole purpose of this session right here is getting control. Stopping this chaos. Remember the, the old uh, cartoon, the Jetsons? Maybe I'm dating myself, all right? George would say, Jane, stop this crazy thing. That's essentially what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to stabilize the system. Okay, enough about that. This is something that I learned from a client probably about 15 years ago. This is the daily work management execution board. This board is actually a physical board. It was in the maintenance shop or the facilities maintenance shop. And what this was, was today, today's schedule, any issues that they have, all right, uh, their bad actor list or their Pareto chart, but everybody knew what the schedule was for that day. And then you picked up your job assignments. So again, it was very visual. So every morning, this is where they held their shift change meetings in front of this board. It was just another means of communication. I, I loved it. 
I absolutely loved it. This meeting right here uh, did not last more than 15 minutes. By the way, this meeting was called a YTT. It's an acronym. You can't be in business, right? You can't be in business without an acronym. YTT stands for yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So in 15 minutes, we're going to start every meeting with safety. Any safety concerns? Anything? No? Good. Great. Let's keep going. What's happened in the facility in the last 24 hours that we need to know about? That's the yesterday. Here's a heads up about what we're doing today. And by the way, here's a heads up about what's going to happen tomorrow. Any questions? Any comments? Any concerns? Any rumors? Good. Get out of here and work safe. It was the most powerful meeting that I've ever. Has anybody ever gone to a meeting to have a meeting, to schedule another meeting, to attend a meeting that you missed on the other meeting? Has that ever happened to anybody? It has to me. Okay. 15 minutes in, out, get to work and do it safely. Um, all right, this is what I was talking about. Your question right here about my dialogues, my work sampling, supervisors actually supervise, all right? And then what we do is of course, we have our measurements and our KPIs in place, okay? Uh, the solution right here for labor, baseline performance requirements. Okay, so this is how it works. You do what's called a job task analysis. These are all the things that you need to do in your position. Then what we do is we do a skills assessment of our current staff. From the skills assessment, we identify a skills gap, okay? From the skills gap analysis. From the skills gap analysis, we develop our training plans. I'm gonna show you an example of that in a second. So that's what this slide essentially is talking about. Um, we need to develop our, our work management procedures. Um, we use our data, which I already talked about. We need to identify what is allowing us to function at 17 to 25% utilization, right? And I showed you that, an example of that with that spreadsheet. Okay, and then implement a sound planning and scheduling uh, department or role if you don't have one already, okay? And if you do, how effective is it? All right, this is it right here. Job task analysis, skills assessment, skills gap analysis, and training program. All right, so this is a program. I did uh, quite a bit of work um, in uh, Russia. And uh, this was the worksheet that I developed for them as far as um, tracking our training program. So again, I don't wanna spend a whole lot of time on here, but this is, this is the job task analysis right there on the left. And then right here is our skills gap. All right, but this right here, again, let me, I'm sorry, let me get out of here. That's this. So those are all the activities that they need to do in these roles. If anybody's ever heard of AKSM, it's uh, again, an acronym, it stands for awareness, uh, knowledge, skilled and master or mastery. So do I need just, do I just need to be aware of what's going on? Do I need to have, excuse me, a little bit of knowledge about this? Or do I need to be skilled in this task? Or do I really, am I gonna become one of the train the trainers? That's the mastery. So we did all that. Here's the competency, who needs and where they are. Uh, here is the uh, competency-based requirements. Okay, so all the individuals, and this is their skills gap analysis right here. Um, then what we developed was the whole training program. And then we tracked when the training was going to happen. And then like any good organization, we need to track our progression against the training plan. Okay. So that, this is just another tool that we can use to ensure that we have the right skill set. Look, as managers, we cannot allow 20, 40, 30, and 10. I would love to have a whole department of 40 percenters. Love to have it, okay? Now, here's one of the other things that I did when I, again, when I was a plant manager, I set up my maintenance department 60, 30, and 10. World-class 90, uh, yeah, 90% of your work is planned. So I assigned 60% of my maintenance staff to do nothing but PM work. All right, PM and, and uh, I'm sorry, PM and PDM. 
All right, so my PDM group went around and did their oil analysis, vibration, you know, their infrared readings, things like that. My PM crew went out there and conducted their PMs, daily, weekly, quarterly, whatever the PMs were. The 10 percenter, all right, I assigned that individual or those individuals to answering the radio or answering the phone. And what I did was I still need to utilize that person. I used that person and I assigned them, and I don't mean this to be derogatory, but I assigned them the remedial work walk around and check the exit lights, right? Paint these handrails, these nagging little jobs that have to get done. But when the radio does go off, drop what you're doing and go respond. Your customers are gonna love that, by the way. Leave this group alone to execute the PMs and the PDM. This person here, their sole responsibility is to answer the, the emergency calls. Does that make sense? All right, at least that's how I set it up. Now, in your, and look, those ratios can run the gamut. Highly reactive uh, organizations, that 10% might be 25% of my, my staff, all right? We need to stabilize the system. We're not gonna be there tomorrow. So, okay, let's, let's be logical about this. 25% of the group, you answer the, the, the emergencies. Another, sorry, my math's not working too quick. The rest of you guys, you do the PM to the PM, okay? All right. Uh, yes. Yeah, that's why I can't allow, I can't have a staff of 20, 30, uh, I'm sorry, 20, 40, 30, and tens, because I'm certainly not going to assign a 10 percenter to answer the, respond to the uh, uh, call, right? In fact, what I am going to do with my 10 percenter is I'm going to document, document, document. By the way, here's a hint. I picked this up from an old colleague of mine. This was brilliant. And I, I used it for years. If I had a 10 percenter and it just wasn't going to work out, I would call that person into my office and I would sit that person down and I would say to them, you know what, it's just not really working out. So why don't you and I uh, develop uh, your exit strategy? Whew. You should have seen some of the reactions on that one, right? One of two things happen. Either they quit or boy, they straighten out real quick. So let's get together. Let's uh, work on your exit strategy, shall we? That was like a two by four inside the head for some people. All right, that was a wake up call. What was your, what was 30%? 30 percenters are the new ones. They don't quite have, they're like brand new to maintenance, all right? Or they may be brand new to the organization, but they got potential, all right? That's what I, that's what I classify my 30 percenters. Uh, this, I'm not gonna go through this, but this would be considered a competency scale right here, all right? So there's my uh, AKS and M definitions. And I believe, all the presentations are available for everybody. So my presentation is available. If it's not, give me your card and I'll email it to you. Or I have some cards up here that I'll give you. Just shoot me something. And again, I will be more than happy to share anything that you see up here. All right? Except, except Leo. I'm not going to share Leo. All right? Because I still love my dog. And I don't kick him inside the head, by the way. All right? Uh, all right. And then again, this is just another example of competence requirements. All right, so again, just a little bit more tools for everybody here. As we say, another bullet to put in your chamber. Control, develop a practical and achievable maintenance schedule. 100%. I can't load you up to 100% utilization because it's unachievable. You have to go to the restroom, you have to eat, all right? You have to do certain things. That, that's what chips away at that 100% utilization. So the challenge is, what is your current state? What is your current utilization of your team? Because if, it's, if it is functioning at 25%, one, you gotta do some major changes like now. But what is realistic and how many hours a day can I, can I really schedule my team? Okay. Um, what else we have? We have... Uh, all right, uh, a baseline the performance. That's what I just talked about. Managers need to develop policies and procedures. Is this a repeat? 
and managers need to use the data identifier. I think that's a repeat. Either that or I'm experiencing deja vu. This right here, this graph right here, this is what's called um, um, your backlog. This is how we uh, schedule. So there's a fallacy out there of what backlog definition is. Backlog is not past due work orders. Backlog is all the work in your CMMS system that has not been planned or executed yet. It's not past due work orders, it's everything. These are all the PMs we got. These are all the PDMs. These are all the corrective maintenance. This is all the maintenance work that we have in our CMMS system that has not been completed yet, regardless of when it was due. All right, we want backlog. We want, backlog is good because that's how we build our maintenance schedules. I want my maintenance planners to be looking out 90 days in advance. All right, so today's Wednesday, right? Right? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, my client that I'm working with right now, I told you this, it's my client right now that I'm working with is in, in the Philippines. So I'm working from uh, 8 p.m. to four in the morning. So it's actually Thursday now for me. So um, it's great. So if anybody wants to know Monday night's football scores, I already know what they are because I'm a day ahead of them. Um, I want my maintenance planners to start looking out 90 days because what I want them to start looking is in those 90 days, we put in nice little weekly buckets and I'm looking at these huge bumps in the schedule, right? This week, I got way too much work. Planners, you start manipulating the earliest start date, the latest finish dates. And we level load that across the board. That's their job, okay? So that's what this slide is really talking about. There's my y reference to the YTT meeting, okay? We break it down into a weekly schedule and then from the weekly schedule, then it gets broken down into a daily schedule. Pretty, pretty simple. Well, simple to say, sometimes harder to do. Uh, this is just a graphic and how it works right here. So we have a combination of PMs and then we have all these other things. And by the end of our scheduling meeting, uh, we have a, a weekly schedule. Um, all right, again, another example. And then that will be the daily schedule. Oh, here it is. I forgot to put this in here. This is exactly what I just talked about. So there's a 30 day call horizon. So 30 days out, your CMMS should automatically release all the PMs. All right, then I want my planners to start looking 90 days and then they do what's called a 52 week rough cut scheduling. So they're taking a look at the whole year. All right, but then their job then is to start manipulating these dates to level load based on our resources and our capacity and our utilization so I can level load the work. What you don't want is something like this, like these red pillars, all right? It's just unachievable. We won't be able to knock off that work. And then I think this is finally what we're gonna talk about um, is of course I have to have KPIs, all right? So, you know, there's an acronym out there, it's called the SMART, okay? So, so we have, you know, they, they need to be realistic, they need to be hard to manipulate. They have to be time-based and all the good things. But I need to have KPIs. I just had this conversation with this group last night. Okay, so what, they're, what we found out last night was some of their bonuses are based on their KPIs. So what are they doing with their KPIs? They're manipulating them, right? KPI, that's not the purpose of KPIs. KPIs, the whole purpose of KPIs or measures or metrics is are we doing the right things or are we not doing the right things? And if we're not doing the right things or we're not achieving what the objectives are, time out. Because what we're doing ain't working. All right, so we got to change the game plan here. All right, we need to figure this out and, and make some changes here because it, we're not achieving our goals and objectives. Okay, I think that's it. Questions? I, I used to have a weekly. Uh, I used to always have a weekly meeting with my staff. All right, and uh, I would end every single meeting with any questions, any comments, any concerns, and I always had the same people pipe up. Right, but it wasn't until I added that fourth bogey there. Any questions? Any comments? Any concerns? Any rumors? I got bombarded with them. 
I always want to know the rumors going on in my facility. Yes, sir. So earlier in the presentation, you mentioned that supervisors five percent supervisors actively supervising. Yep. On the flip side, too much supervision makes you like to make true. So what's the percentage of active supervision? What should be the percentage and what, what does that percentage mean to active supervision? 31.27%? No. You know, I don't know. That's hard for me to answer that, right? Because every situation is different because we all have a different skill set within. Some need to be supervised, some don't need to be supervised. Um, you know, in, in, in the supervision and leadership training, you know, one of the things we talk about is supervisors or managers wear many different hats. Sometimes we're supervisors, sometimes we're consultants, um, sometimes we're trainers. Okay, so, you know, we wear many different, and coaches, so many times we're, we wear many different hats. So is there, is there a, a silver bullet or percentage that they should be spending? No, but I will say this. Has anybody ever heard of the term Gemba? Yeah. Of, uh, Gemba walks. Uh, well, it's not Six Sigma. Gemba, loose translation of that is go to the place of value. Get out of your office and go. Get out of your place and go and visit the job sites. Now, when I say active supervision, I'm not necessarily, I'm just talking about get some face time. All right. That's all I'm talking about. Make sure that they're working safe. Is there, look, a supervisor, if you really want to boil it down, our role as supervisors and managers was to remove the barriers that are preventing our employees from working safe. And, and get, I've never met a maintenance technician to say, man, I hope today I do a really lousy job. I mean, a good day for an operator or a good day for a maintenance technician is they come in at the start of their shift, they got a full day's worth of work. And at the end of the day, they go home and they self-medicate. I mean, that's a good day, right? I mean, that's a good day for me. So um, I, again, I don't really have an answer on what percentage, but I do want, I do want some my supervisors to get faced. They need to be visible. Maybe that's the way I should say it. They need to be visible. Anybody else? Yes, sir. What's your, um, what's your take on the whole outsourcing? Yeah, that's always, I always get asked that question, by the way. I worked with a company, some of you may have heard it. It's a, a company named Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola years ago wanted to outsource their maintenance activities. And they asked me to come in and, and review their contract for their supply, for their outsourced maintenance contract. I got done reading the contract and I said, I'll tell you what, if this company can do everything they say they can do in this contract, I'll go and work for them, okay? I don't have any issues with contracting maintenance out. What I do have an issue is terms of the contract are not crystal clear. Expectations are not black and white. Key performance indicators for performance are not black and white. So I got no problem with contracting maintenance out. Contract has to be boom, 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 boom. And we all agree on it. That may not answer your question, but that's where I see companies get into trouble is they wanna outsource because it's a cost reduction or it's a, the headache goes away or whatever the case may be, but then sometime down the road. And that's what happened with Coca-Cola, by the way, all right? 18 months later, they called me back up and said, hey, can you come back in here and train my maintenance planners? Uh, because they, <laughs> they all left and nobody knew what was going to happen or knew what was going on. Did that answer your question? It does. How does it, so obviously in the, in the facilities department, you have different um, grades. Um, and speaking to your outside, so your landscaping, lawn care, mm -hmm stuff like that that's in house in your experience what's better for the organization keeping those talents in house or having subcontractors do that work okay in your example right there i, I don't i don't really have an opinion on whether you keep it in house or out because it's not that again i'm using your example specifically that's not necessarily a skill set that i can afford to lose and what I mean by that is I can, I can contract lawn services. I can, I can contract snow removal. I know I'm in Florida, but some places I go, they actually have snow. 
you know, snow removal things, things like that. That's, that's almost to the point where that's a commodity, if that makes sense. It's the skill set that I really want to make sure that one, I would love to keep it in house. If that's not an option, I want to make sure that whoever that contractor is, is sharing with me the best practices because someday they may leave and I can't risk my organization with you leaving and taking that knowledge with you. I need to retain that knowledge in house. Again, does that make sense? Okay. The other stuff I would just say that's more of a commodity. I got no problem, you know, lowest bid, whatever the case may be. Anybody else? Oh, geez, he just joined us. Now I got to start all over again. All right, let's go back to these. Anybody else? What is the percentage of the staff generally that's the scientist? Sixty, thirty, ten. That was my situation. All right, that's when we stabilized the system. Um, that's the ratio. Now I didn't start out as sixty, thirty, ten. All right, because when I took over, we were a very reactive organization. So I assigned, like I said, about twenty-five percent of my staff to just emergencies. But then we, gradually, as we stabilized the processes and stabilized the facility, then my percentage, my my ratio started changing. All right. Anybody? When you say that 60, 30, 10, 60 is PM, 30 is PM. No, no, 60% was PM and PDM. 30% okay. was corrective maintenance. And then 10% was emergency. Anybody else? Going once? Going towards. Again, one last thing. If you do need any of those spreadsheets, again, I will more than share with them. I have a business card, or you can give me your business card. I will be more than happy to share it with you. I will email the presentation to you as well. Again, there's no secrets. And if there's no more questions, you guys are off the Budweiser hot seats. All right. For those old enough to remember that commercial. Thank you, guys.